Good evening, church family, and welcome to another Wednesday in the Word from home. And tonight, we are going to begin a study looking at the book of Jonah. And Jonah's life really depicts a life that is, there's a lot of principles that we can draw from this about, am I going to be running towards God and running to God's will, or am I going to be running away from God's will? Jonah is often a book that is referenced in many other messages, but I wanted us to take a few weeks and really dive into this book and see how God is speaking to Jonah, then evaluate Jonah's reactions to God's leading in his life, and then make some comparisons in our own hearts and in our own lives and really begin to see how we can decide if I'm going to follow after God and run towards God, or am I going to be running away from God? And so tonight we're going to be in Jonah chapter 1, so I invite you to open your Bibles there in your homes to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah is one of the minor prophets, not because he was of any less value, but simply because his book was shorter than the others, the other major prophets who had a lot to write and a lot to say. So Jonah, beginning in chapter 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So the first thing that we're going to see tonight is that the command from God comes. So God reaches out to Jonah, he speaks directly to him, and he gives him a very clear instruction about what he wants. God tells Jonah, I want you to arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Why? Because their wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was an awful place. The kingdom of Assyria, Nineveh was the capital city. The kingdom of Assyria was a terrible place in history. It actually began from the small uh, uh, trading community in the city of Asher. The Ashurians later slurred to be the Assyrians. According, though, as their empire grew, the way it grew was not through trading, commerce, diplomacy. But historian Joshua Mark says this, the Assyrians' administrative skills were impressive. They could be adept at diplomacy when necessary. But these were not the means by which the empire grew to rule the ancient world from Egypt in the south through Mesopotamia and over to Asia Minor. It was their skill in warfare. They had conquered through their superior abilities in siege warfare, and their reliance, another historian said, on sheer, unadulterated terror. There was a standing policy that those who resisted would be made an example of, so that way others would fear them. One inscription that was found in an ancient temple recounts the story of a people who had been conquered, then they had rebelled, and then they had been reconquered by King Ashurbanipal. And it says this, quote, I built a pillar at the city gate. I flayed all the chief men who had revolted, and I covered the pillar with their skins. Others I walled up inside the pillar, Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. So basically making this monument of saying, if you choose to rebel against us, guess what is going to happen to you? We are going to come back in. We are going to subjugate you once again. We are going to skin you alive. And we are going to make this pillar, we're going to wrap the pillar. Not with rock or brick or, or some other kind of decorative paint. No, we are going to use your skins. And not only that, but uh, we're going to brick some of you on the inside, so that way you'll be pounding alive trying to escape. 
Others of you will impale. It was just an awful, grotesque display to cause other people to shirk back in fear. But because this is how they were, these cruel, murderous, heartless people, it worked in the short term. They were the most feared in the ancient world, but they were also the most hated. At a, at a moment's notice, when someone, when a, a little city-state, when, when another nation thought that they would be able to rise up and free themselves from the Assyrian Empire, it happened time and time and time again. So these are the people, these cruel, murderous, heartless people. These are the ones that God was telling Jonah to go to. These are the ones that God says, Arise! Go to these murderers. Go to these heartless people. Go to Nineveh, that, that city of hundreds of thousands of people, and I want you to speak out against them because their wickedness has come up before me in heaven. I don't want them to remain in their wickedness. I want them to be confronted with their sinfulness. And I want you, my prophet, to go and tell them. Now, if you had known that these were the kind of people that were so filled with anger and hatred, and if anyone dared to stand up against them, that you would be made an example, how willing would you be to go? It's easy for us to sit here and look at Jonah and say, huh, Jonah, come on, God gave you an instruction, Jonah, just go, just do it. I mean, if God spoke to me like that, I would go. All right, let's put that in a modern day context. Arise, Christian. Go to Antifa, that terrorist organization, and cry out against it. Arise, Christian, go to the neo-Nazis and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Arise, go to the ones who want to defund the police, that growing organization, and cry out against it. Arise, Christian, my genuine disciples, Go to the cultural Christians around you, that, that flourishing organization that loves to just speak about Christianity but dares not actually live as a disciple of Christ and cry out against them. Arise. Go to the lost, the angry, the hurting, the Christ-hating atheists. And tell them the truth. Would you go? Would you put yourself potentially in harm's way? Arise. Go to the terrorists of the Middle East. Go to the communists in China. Go to those who hate everything that you stand for and speak out against them because their wickedness has come up before me, God says. It's easy for us to look at Jonah and say, oh, come on. Jonah, God told you to go. Why wouldn't you go? But when we actually put it into the context of our own modern day Ninevites, the people who hate you, the people who would like to see you dead, the people who would like to see you subjugated, the people who would like to tear away everything that you have built your life upon. Are you willing to listen to God and go? Are you willing to give them the gospel? 
Are you willing to speak the love of Christ when all that is hurled back your direction is hate? Or is it just easier to lash out in fleshly hatred as well? Arise, the commandment says, and go. You see, this is one of the hardest things that in every age of God's people, God has been telling His people not to sit comfortably where you are, but to arise. Wake up out of your sleep, as it says in Romans. And the last, one of the last things Jesus said as He was preparing to ascend back into heaven was go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Arise. and Go. We need to get outside of this. The, the, uh, of, of our own church setting. We need to go into the world. God didn't say, all right, Jonah, be prepared. I'm bringing all the Ninevites to you. Sit where you are and just prepare. Here it comes, and the revival is going to happen once they come to you. No, He told Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. Go to that great city. Go to those people that hate Me. Go to those people that aren't following the law. Go to those people that know nothing about who I am. And preach repentance, Jonah. Show them that I am a God of mercy. That I am a God of grace. Show them. Be my prophet. For how shall they hear without a preacher? But how beautiful are the feet of them who go and bring the good tidings of the Gospel of peace. So arise and go. Jonah does go. But in verse 3, it talks about the fact that he went the wrong way. Instead of listening to God, instead of submitting to God's clear, clear instruction, Jonah allows his own prejudice and I'm sure some fear Book of Nahum in chapter 1 also describes how terrible the city of Nineveh was. Woe to that bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. Its victims never depart. The noise of a whip, the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Woe to that bloody city. This could describe any number of cities and even the the whole entire governmental complex that we have here in the United States of America. Maybe instead of horsemen though, we just insert lobbyists. Instead of rattling wheels, it's, it's high dollar dinner parties. Instead of holding up bright sword and glittering spear, Now it's simply your brightly colored Instagram photos and (laughs) your stories that you take with your, your cell phone. These videos that can so easily and so quickly spread. But what does it leave in its wake? A multitude of slain. A great number of bodies. Countless corpses. Lives that have just been destroyed. I'm sure Jonah was scared. I know I would be. There are times that fear just grips us and causes us to say, "Mm, sorry God, that's too much. That's a step too far. You can't really expect me to do that. It could also be his own prejudice, his own bias, his own hatred for a people that so clearly don't like God. There are people all around us every single day that are trying to tear down many religious institutions. They are trying to rip apart 
the church. They are trying to take away the freedom to be able to assemble. I get that. But you know what? God tells us to arise and go to those people. And we cannot let our own anger, bitterness, our our own disdain for them trying to tear apart the things that we so deeply value. We cannot let that stop us from arising and going and giving them the Gospel. Jonah rose up and he went the exact opposite direction. It says that he went down to Joppa, and here's a little map, so that way you can kind of get a a picture of what this would look like in the geography of the ancient Near East. He went down to Joppa, and instead of going 550 miles to the northeast to where Nineveh was, he gets on a ship that went west 2,500 miles to Tarshish. It was a large trade city in Spain. It was probably the farthest away from what God had said to do in the opposite direction that He could have gone. In our own modern day geography here in the Sacramento region, it would be as if God said, okay, Here's what I want you to do, Roosevelt Baptist Church. I want you to arise and send a missions group to Portland, Oregon. (laughs) Portland? God! They hate Christianity! Portlandia is this, this place that they are all about so many things that are so ungodly and so unchristian. They hate everything that we stand for. God, did I hear you correctly? Let me clear out my ears a little bit and listen again. And God says, yes, I want you to spend your hard-earned money and I want you to take your vacation time and I want you to take your teens and your children and the people from your church and go to Portland, Oregon. To give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But instead of doing that, you know what we're going to do? We are going to commission a group from our church to go 2,500 miles in the other direction and have a vacation in Hawaii. Because I don't really want to go north. I want to run as far away from that as I can. 2,500 miles in the other direction. Telling God, nah. God, that's too much. That's too far. But you see, that's the thing, is when we get off mission, when we are not doing the things that God has so clearly called us to do, it's very easy to run in the opposite direction. It's very easy to, set, to tell God, no! I'm not going to do that! God, here's a list of things you can't ask me to do, and that's where I will say yes. But you know what God often does to us? He often instructs us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone and outside of our control, and He wants to stretch even our own abilities. Because then, when people get saved, when lives are transformed, we don't take the glory for ourselves. We have to say, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This had to have been God because it's beyond what we could have done on our own. But when we never get outside of our comfort zones, when we stay right where we are, when we never try new things, then we absorb a lot of God's glory for ourselves. We absorb and don't get to see a lot of what God wants to do in us. Probably one of the most disturbing things, though, is he was not just running from God's will in this. Verse 3 very clearly says, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He wasn't just trying to run away from what God was instructing him to do. 
He was trying to run away from God Himself. And you see, this is the thing that, that we, we try to compartmentalize things a lot in our lives, in our culture. But you don't get to say, okay, God, I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do, but I still want to have a good relationship with you. No, by running away from God's instruction, you are essentially running away from God. And Jonah here even admits it. He's trying to run away from the very presence of God, which is just so foolish. I mean, Psalm 139 is so clear. Where shall I go from your, pre- from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. This is one of the most ridiculous things he could have tried to do. Trying to run away from the very presence of God. But you see, that's the problem with sin. That's the problem with pride and selfishness. Is that it convinces us that it actually makes sense to do something terribly foolish. When we look at at a lot of things in our life through the lens of, of the Scriptures and through what God is trying to teach us and who Jesus Christ is and through the lens of the Gospel, sinful things clearly look sinful. But what I kind of think of as the, the fog of temptation. starts to roll in there and it obscures our vision and, and it, it allows us to th- well, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe that's not such a foolish thing to do. And before we know it, we're giving in. So tonight, I want you to think about your own life. As we begin this series in the book of Jonah, Where are you trying to run away from God? What has God clearly told you? This is what I want you to do. This is an instruction that I have given to you. This is something that you need to change. And yet you have either consciously told God no, or subconsciously just kind of avoided and not dealt with what He wants you to do. And you're trying to run away from God Himself. Trying to run away from God's will. We're going to see next week how well that works out. And the answer is, not good. So just submit to Him tonight. Ask God's presence to be with you. Ask Him to fill you and remove that fog of temptation so you can clearly see what is right and what is wrong in your life. So you can clearly see how you can follow Him and be more like Christ. Do you know Jesus is your Savior tonight? If you have questions about what that means, if you have questions or you'd like some counseling about how you can draw closer to the Lord, I'll be waiting by the phone right now encourage you to call us, text us right now. I'm waiting for you. I'd love to talk with you and help show you from the Scriptures that the Bible has the answer for every question in your life. Jesus Christ is the answer to our deepest needs. Let's draw closer to Him this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this night. Lord, help us to put off the temptation to run away from You. And help us, Lord, to yield and run towards You with all of our might, all of our excitement, all of our passion. Or whatever it is that we might be running from You tonight, convict us, help us to repent, help us to humbly submit. In Jesus' wonderful name, Amen.